Welcome everybody. Happy to, uh, on this glorious spring day, welcome you to uh, what is now the 30th of these TDSB OISE webinars in environmental education. Uh, how incredible that is to have done 30 webinars over the last year. Our first one was April 7th, um, a year ago, and uh, we're, I've learned so much uh, being involved in facilitating these webinars and I'm really pleased to welcome you to, to number 30. My name is Hilary Inwood. I'm the lead of environmental and sustainability education and these webinars are done in conjunction with a, an amazing partnership we have with the TDSB's Eco Schools program and so I'd like to welcome my colleagues Jen Vetter and uh, Chris Metropolis to uh, this uh, webinar who are here with us. We've also got Elise Kennedy in the room who is uh, the, one of the incredible um, staff who support the work on, on our side at the OIC side and we're so thrilled to see so many teachers in the room with us today. Uh, teachers, principals, um, uh, early childhood educators. Uh, I see Hong Liang in the room as well so uh, really thrilled to have you here and uh, I know our numbers will continue to grow over the next uh, few minutes. We have triggered the entry poll and we invite you please to complete that. We always like to know a little bit about who's in the room and we've got um, quite a few uh, primary educators weighing in so far, lots of teacher candidates from OISE. So we're thrilled to have all of you with us um, as we uh, hear, uh, learn today about principals' perspectives on outdoor learning. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen so that we can, whoop, there we go, get underway with the slideshow. Um, and uh, we always, begin with a little overview just to let you know what's gonna happen over the next uh, 50 to 60 minutes. We'll start with uh, land acknowledgement. Um, I'm gonna put a little plug in for the upcoming environmental ed conference, which we're organizing with the TDSB's Eco Schools team. And uh, then we've got four amazing principals from the Toronto District School Board who will be speaking today. Uh, Dan Fisher, Judith Kramer, Amy Slater, and David Hawker Budlowski. And as always, we really encourage you to get involved in this session as well. Please pop your chat window open and you're welcome to introduce yourselves in the chat. Let us know uh, who you are and where you're from. And uh, we always encourage you to put your questions and your comments um, in as part of uh, uh, the uh, presentations. And we will relay those to the presenters as we go. With that in mind, I've got a beautiful work by Christy Valcourt to accompany the land acknowledgement. This is the land acknowledgement that the TDSB encourages us to use and we're welcome, we are always happy to do that. Um, Christy is um, a Machif or Mati, a visual artist with a deep respect for Mother Earth, the traditions and the knowledge of her people. In addition to her paintings, she's also uh, known as a community-based artist. Uh, she's a strong environmentalist and an advocate uh, for the lands, the waters and for indigenous people themselves. She's currently a lead organizer of the Onaman Collective with uh, Isaac Murdoch. Uh, and um, their collective focuses on resurgence of indigenous languages and land-based practices. And Christie's work is found uh, within the permanent collections of the National Gallery of Canada, the Canadian Museum of Civilization, uh, which is now the natural, I think our National History Museum, I think it's called now, um, and the uh, Art Gallery of Ontario. So this is a beautiful piece by her called Honoring Her my spirit helpers and uh, you can find more of her works on her website. I encourage you to use uh, indigenous uh, art made by indigenous artists as a way into decolonization, reconciliation and learning more about indigenous ways of knowing. So please join me as we acknowledge that we're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people on the land that is now known as Canada, but as many known uh, by many as Turtle Island uh, as well. So um, with that in mind, uh, I am gonna, and there was a reason I chose Christie's work today. We have introduced her work in the past. We've also introduced the work of Isaac Murdoch, who she works with closely. And I've done that as a little entree into the um, conference that we're organizing with the TDSB's Eco Schools program, as well as uh, Eco Schools Canada and the Natural Curiosity Project. Uh, all of us are very pleased to be um, offering this conference in, uh, in just a, just about a month. It's uh, coming up April 21st to 24th and uh, we're thrilled to be um, offering it um, on the topic of urban environmental education and certainly with what the principals are going to be talking about 
doing uh, outdoor education in the TDSB uh, completely aligns with that topic. So um, please, if you haven't registered yet, we would love to have you. TDSB teachers get a generous subsidy that is being supported by the TDSB's Eco Schools program. So we really do encourage you to register. And Jen Vetter is with us in the room. So if you're a TDSB teacher and you want some more information on the subsidy, Jen is the one you're going to talk to. Uh, we would love to have a really great turnout. We also have subsidies, full subsidies for TDSB grade 11 and 12 students. So you can talk to Jen about that as well and she'd be happy to give you some more information. So um, I'm gonna encourage Elise to pop the link to the conference uh, site, please into the chat uh, so that you've got that um, to, to, if you'd like to register. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen I've done all of my introductory material. And at this point, I'm gonna introduce each of the principals as they speak. And then we're gonna to start today with Dan Fisher. So Dan is an elementary principal in the TDSB. He's uh, for over 25 years, he's worked in a variety of communities across the GTA. He's the current uh, principal of an OPAL school. OPAL stands for outdoor play and learning. And he's enjoyed um, learning about how loose parts play can enrich students physical and mental well-being as part of that. Uh, he recently re completed his master's of education. Congratulations on that. Dan, was it from Oise or somewhere else that should not be, not, not be named? Uh, I don't, I didn't get into Oise, so. Oh, Dan, Sorry. I can't believe that. Okay, well, I'll have to go and slap some hands at the other side for not letting you I'm in. Just kidding. Love, love to I'm have had you there, but we're happy you finished your master's of ed. And he did that with a focus on loose parts play and special education. He enjoys um, mentoring and presenting to parent councils and school staff on the importance of out uh, of open-ended excuse me open-ended outdoor play so Dan we're really welcome really welcoming you here today thank you thanks Hillary uh, thanks everybody for being here I noticed some of you work at my school <laughs> so I apologize in advance if this is all deja vu but for the rest of you I hope it's uh, it's new learning and exciting stuff I'm going to share my screen right that's what I'm doing next uh, let's go here okay so um, I'm just going to get started. Today, I'm, I've got about 10 minutes to tell you a little bit about my journey and our journey as a school uh, at Kensington Community School. I got here about um, five years ago as the principal, and uh, when I arrived, I was really quite taken with how terrible our playground was. And uh, the playground is the image on the left, as you can probably guess. The image on the right is a, is a really nice prison in Southern California. Um, a lot of our playgrounds look like this, unfortunately, uh, just sort of asphalt wastelands where the kids uh, largely practice bullying and then uh, come back in, I guess. That's what happens a lot of the time. So um, I got to work trying to, trying to make over the schoolyard uh, within my first few months, really, because it really wasn't meeting our needs. And, uh, you know, you can see we had needles, we had lots of garbage and vandalism, we had lots of people using the yard as a public latrine, it was really quite depressing. Uh, and the most depressing part about the yard for me, when I got to Kensington was uh, our climber, we had this really weird old climber that uh, I don't have a picture of, but this is a stand in for it anyway, um, had all these weird rules around it, you, you could only traverse it in a certain direction. I think it was clockwise, I can't remember. You weren't allowed to use it if it had been raining. Um, you had to be direct, you had to be supervised at all times if you were on the climber. Uh, you couldn't go up the tires, you could only go down the tires. It was too much to keep track of and consequently most of the time the kids didn't use it. Uh, it was also full of needles. So we ended up getting rid of that climber. And we started a, uh, a program called OPAL, which stands for Outdoor Play and Learning. Uh, it's a program that uh, is based out of the UK, but um, schools here in the TDSB have had access to it. And it's essentially a loose parts play program, uh, which provides schools with mentoring and uh, printed resources, among other things, to begin a cultural shift away from sort of a deficit model in terms of thinking about kids and their play and towards a model that's a lot more child-centered and a lot more developmentally um, appropriate. So what we did, in addition to trying to get the playground renovated, was we just started with what the kids were already doing, which uh, in our school was we had this uh, sort of crevice in the earth where the kids would dig with pieces of garbage from their lunch. Um, that's, that's really all they had at that point. Um, so I said, well, hey, how about some buckets? How about some spades? Um, 
how about some tubes and some cardboard and some tires? And very quickly, the kids did great things with them. Not only uh, were there no fatalities, but they began doing really creative things. Um, and they didn't need to be shown how to do that or, or led through that or, you know, have it modeled or anything. Um, and because we started with things that they were already doing and that are, as I say, relatively, uh, you know, benign, it led to some really nice moments out there on the yard. We had a spontaneous uh, tug of war between the grade sixes and the entire rest of the school one day. They found this giant hose and they just had a tug of war. Uh, they made hammocks. Um, one of the things, and this might be the most important slide in my presentation, one of the things that uh, we spent a lot of time talking about as we began exploring um, all of these new opportunities for our kids was this very important distinction. And I think, um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of us have been raised, and especially if you've been through Teachers College recently, maybe this is, you know, kind of how people think, which is that everything might be dangerous to the kids. And if you start from that perspective as a leader or as a teacher, what you end up doing is you remove a lot of the opportunities for, for growth and for enjoyment uh, from the outdoors for our, for our kids. Um, I think we, we obviously don't want glass in the sand pit. We obviously don't want exposed wiring on the back of the building. We don't want cars on the playground. Uh, those things are hazards. They don't give our kids any benefit and they legitimately might, might hurt them. What we do want is to provide kids with the opportunity to figure out how to jump from one log to another, or how long can they hang from the monkey bars, or how high can they build a tower of milk crates. Um, these are the things, the very things that make play enjoyable and engaging, and these are the moments that provide kids with that important growth, whether it's physical literacy, whether it's social skills, creativity, communication, uh, there's a whole host of benefits that they get from play. And if we build playgrounds and outdoor programs that are as safe as possible, as opposed to as safe as necessary, we end up really sanitizing it to the point, I think, where there's very little of value out there for our kids. So over the course of of a few years really, we began our culture shift um, and we celebrated what we were doing and seeing outside. We had bulletin board displays, we had announcements, we had um, our play policy, which we created and posted in our parent handbook. And we made sure that everybody knew the value and, and knew that we were seeing the value um, of what was going on out on the yard. Um, I won't, I won't uh, go on too much about this, but hopefully you all have leaders in your lives or you yourselves are leaders and you have some of these sorts of approaches to how you do things. I would suggest that the um, loose parts play is built on a culture of trust. And I would, success, I would suggest that a culture of trust in a lot of cases is built on literally saying the words, I trust your judgment. Um, if you're a micromanager, you're probably not gonna be able to do this in your own school. You're not gonna be able to keep track of everything that's going on. You do have to trust people to do a good job. And, and the teachers have to trust the kids. And as that starts to happen, it really can transform your culture. And that's a unique thing that I think outdoor play offers us um, and loose parts play can offer to your school. I realize the picture on the left might strike terror into some people's hearts. For me, it's not even worthy of, it's, it's, so, it's so normal. Uh, this is just what we do at our school. Um, we've got drum kits and things that we build with found items. We are climbing trees, we're building structures. Um, we're having a great time. The kids will surprise you on an almost daily basis. They will do things that you just didn't conceive of because your adult brain has sort of stopped thinking that way. Uh, this is this is literally steam innovation. There's steam that comes out of that vent, and the kids made themselves a heated seat so that in the fall, when it was cold, they could be up high right next to the the warmth. They've done hundreds of things like this, and you can imagine the math that went into this. You can imagine the problem solving, the communication, the trial and error, the planning, the design cycle. It's all there for the taking. Um, if you can uh, just provide them with these parts and then sort of um, check your own anxiety as an adult and, and just take note of it. 
it's it's all there for you. Uh, I haven't filled this presentation with graphs and charts and things, but uh, as was mentioned, I did just finish my master's. And one of the things that I was inspired to do after such a positive initial experience with loose parts was to go looking for some of the research that really justifies what I was seeing at my school. And clearly what I have discovered, if you look across um, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, North America, any of the places where there are well-established loose parts programs in schools, it's very, very clear that children are more active, they're more engaged, they're more creative. Um, they get a chance to practice what a lot of us think of as 21st century learning, you know, the six C's that Michael Fullen talks about. It's all enhanced and brought out through loose parts play outdoors. Um, so I wanted to make sure it wasn't just my imagination that this was going really well. The truth is this goes really well all over the place and it goes really well in more affluent parts of the world. It goes really well in neighborhoods that are more challenging. Um, there are ways to make this work pretty much anywhere and you see the same sorts of behaviors and positive outcomes. And I'm trying to hit my 10 minute mark. I think I'm pretty close, right? <laughs> if I'm you speed are, you talking, are. you're I'm doing okay. great. Thanks, Dan. Am I okay? Okay, thank oh, you. You're fine. So um, I know I've covered a lot of things in my in my eight and a half minutes, but I just wanted to end on this. Our kids, kids in general, and certainly in our model, they, they spend up to two years outside by the time they leave us, right? They start with us in kindergarten, they leave in grade eight. If you add up all of their recesses and lunch hours, they're spending an equivalent, you know, that's about two years worth of time. I know as a principal, we spend a lot of time talking about literacy and numeracy. We spend a lot of time talking about social skills. We spend, there are lots of things that make the list. I would suggest that most schools don't have a plan for this 20%. I would suggest most schools are just sort of releasing the kids onto the yard and hoping for the best. This I think is a real squandered opportunity. And, and so my question would be for, for any school leaders or anybody on the call, Given this opportunity, what are you consciously doing at your school to take advantage of this and to make sure that your students' needs are being met and that you are um, that you're enhancing their experience at school, especially given the pandemic and all the rest of it? So that's what I leave you with. Um, and that's my email, obviously. And I certainly enjoy talking about this a lot. So uh, feel free to find me afterwards and we'll keep the conversation going. Dan, thank you so much. If you have any questions for Dan or any comments, feel free to pop them in the chat. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer those as, as you go. We've been putting some information about Opal into the chat as well uh, as we've been going along. So uh, we have got um, the link to the Eco, uh, Eco Kids website where we're the originators of the Opal programs. And uh, as well as we had two webinars on Opal specifically last June led by Linda Nacarato. Um, David Hawker Budlowski, you might be able to post some information in the chat for us about open materials specifically for the TDSB. So I encourage you to do that if you can uh, locate those for us. I'll actually put it up in part of my 10 minutes. Oh, excellent. So people just should hold tight then. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, Dan, your presentation really inspired me. I loved seeing that principals are prepared to take you know, risks and allow their students to take risks as part of the learning. That's uh, so important for embodied forms of learning. Um, and uh, as Ma has just pointed out, great way to, to tie in STEM skills on the playground, which is fantastic. Uh, so again, if you have uh, questions for or comments for Dan, please pop them in the chat. I'd like to introduce you to our second principal uh, for the panel today, and that's uh, Judy Kramer. Uh, Judy is an elementary principal in downtown Toronto in the Toronto District School Board. She started her educational career working with the Ministry of Natural Resources as an educator in the Huntsville area. And then she moved on to working with uh, TRCA, the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, before joining the TDSB as a program specialist at Forest Valley Outdoor Ed Center. After teaching in the classroom for several years and before becoming an administrator, uh, Judith was the site supervisor at Warren Park uh, OE Center, uh, which is one of the TDSB's day use outdoor education centers. Uh, outdoor learning and exploring has always been an integral part of her career, no matter what her title. So welcome, Judy. We're really thrilled to have you here today. It's great to be here. Thank you. Um, I was talking to colleagues because uh, 
we're all feeling it, right? We're all feeling the time right now. And I keep asking my colleagues and keep asking my uh, team at the school, remember what gives you joy and try to find that in the day because it's been a bit of a drudge as we travel along. So this is giving me joy. So thank you for putting this together. We so I don't know, I'm gonna play a news clip. I just thought you might enjoy this news clip, please. I think I put shared the sound. Exploring the inside of Royal York Station. The automatic entrance was closed as officials wanted to keep the animals safe as they worked to rescue it. The beaver was first spotted a little after 7 a.m. and more than an hour later, it was back inside. After spending some time in the care of a TTC supervisor, Animal Services was able to safely bring the creature outside. And officers didn't waste time getting the beaver back to its natural habitat. It was released into the river near Old Mill, and it was seen jumping into the water and swimming away. So I just Judy, what I want to know is, did they did the TTC um, officers ticket that beaver for not paying the fare? Yeah, you know, it, I think they qualify as under 13, right? Don't they ride for free? <laughs> Maybe, maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I th that came across my news feed this morning. So I thought that would be kind of a, the nature always wins. That's down, that's Toronto, right? Where we are sitting on watershed, right? So that beaver was, we're actually the visitor. That beaver was where that beaver needed to be. But um, so I thought that would be a good kickoff. So I just wanted to ground you in terms of where my school is located. Uh, this is my school. It's a brand new school. It's only it's just over a year and a half old, the building. This is the Gardner Expressway. So to land yourself, the Sky Dome and the CN Tower are right over here on the other side of Spadina. This is the school. We share the campus with the Catholic school. And then this is a community and rec center. And yes, it's a green roof. There's a rooftop basketball court. This is part of the rec center, the neighborhood. Oh, I keep calling it the wrong thing. And they keep rec community and recreation center. And so this is our yard, right? So this is AstroTurf. I don't know if you remember when the Raptors were in the finals and you saw that big field with the, with the Raptors logo on in the middle of it. If you know Toronto, that's this field. The big red canoe, if you drive along the Gardner, is right here. So we're pretty, when I say downtown, we're downtown, right? But that doesn't mean you can't go outside. So um, I wanted to talk about in my presentation, just kind of, what you can do in a school setting in whatever environment. So when you're thinking as um, anything that happens inside can happen outside. That's my bottom line. So um, when you're setting your norms and expectations, when you are building your community, when you're learning about the identities of the members of your community, um, which is your classroom or larger or wherever, you're setting norms. Those. Part of that process can also be when we're inside, when we're outside. What are we expecting of each other? What do we expect in terms of our play? So if you are outdoor ready, you hear this, right? Respect yourself, respect each other, respect the environment. So those are kind of driving principles. I think good principles for life. Um, a lot of language can come out of that. What is respect? What does that look like? What does that sound like? Because that's one of those words that um, we, we banty about a lot and we don't necessarily, you know, dig into it to see how the kids are doing and do they know what it means and what it looks like, right? So take the time. You take the time in your classroom, so why not take the time? This is, a, as a community, we're going to spend 300 minutes a day with each other, 1,500 minutes a week, more than two years outside, right? So just take that time. You're building and revisiting those norms, and I would make those public. And um that will help because I, I get it, right? I come, you've seen, you've heard my background. I come from um, the background of being outside and I kind of grew up and learned experience with all of that piece. But uh, um, uh, so just go with the flow with it and, and take the time to practice with that. And it's not only for outdoor excursions, right? How do we travel from point A to point B? Um, it doesn't necessarily, why do we want you to be quiet in the hallway? Why do we want you to cluster together and be together outside or inside? What's safety? So these are all these questions of the whys, because my experience has been is if there's understanding of the expectations, understanding why those are, then there's longevity in them. And so I would begin, start small. If you're, I get, 
as a new teacher, as a beginning teacher, you've got your class, you're going out, you saw my urban setting. Oh my goodness, what happens if they run away? I've got the under the gardener, we've got all of that piece down there. I've got, like, we've got all these different things. I'm really worried. So start with, okay, we're taking a field trip to the climber. Let's go on our field trip and then have an activity on the climber that you have outside in your schoolyard. Or we're going and we're doing our read aloud outside on the rocks. And to Dan, I totally related to the digging in the sand. And it was just amazing, like all the different activities, like watch what the kids are doing. So I tell you and Dan and, and everybody else who's an administrator on this, I loved all the snow we got because the kids were, there were no, like they were engaged and just like with all the Opal equipment that's outside, they're getting there, they're curious. And so it's an opportunity for curiosity. So start small, take a field trip to the climber and they'll, trust me, even the older kids are like, we're not, we're going outside and it's not recess. What's this all about? I'm not sure what I know what this is about, but I'm okay with it, right? Um, and then you can extend it. It's like, take a walk around the block. Um, and then all like start small and just travel along as, you're, as you get the comfort level and then take the time that you need with it and follow up with the expectations because whatever's happening inside can also happen outside. I just always like to reiterate that. I'll give an example. When I was teaching, I taught in um, Flemington Park at Grenoble, right near the Science Center. I'll talk about that in a second. But I lived in, a, I had my last two years were in a portable and I called it my sweat box because in the summertime, it was like a big metal box that was hot. So we just opened the door and we happened to be on this little tiny ravine, like tiny. I mean, I think it might've been 10 feet deep. Like it was tiny. And I would just open both doors and I could have the kids outside. They would be just doing their reading outside or inside. And it just was where they were comfortable. So it's just literally just opening the door, setting the structure and then um, going with it. So that's where to begin. I do wanna, I thought I'd take the rest of the time just to share some examples of me as a teacher and what's happening right now at Jean Lum Public School as a couple of examples. So one, when I was teaching at the school at Grenoble at um, Don Mills in Eglinton, we were right across Don Mills from the Science Center. And you know that whole Earl Bales park system, the Sunnybrook park system behind. So um, a teacher, uh, I partnered up with another teacher. It actually was the other teacher's idea. And he said, why don't we go on Wednesday walks? Every Wednesday, the two classes and the two of us would go for a walk um, for about an hour. We made sure we were back by morning recess if we had, so we were back by yard duty time. And we set it up with the kids. We walked across Don Mills. We went around behind the, the science center into the Don Valley and we would do whatever. We did math activities, popsicle sticks are your friends or two pens, right? You can, angles are a lot more fun. At that time, four, uh, grade four was protractor world. So you walk around measure an angle, okay, lay it down on protractor, you've got an angle. You talk about um, just what they're seeing. It's also, there's nothing wrong with just walking, right? You don't need to, that is curriculum in itself, right? We talked about, we're walking on a sidewalk, so there's somebody coming forward, what are we gonna do? Should they have to step up onto the road? And then that explains why we walk on one side of the sidewalk usually, so we can share the space, it's the lived experiences. So we, I just have a funny story about that because we said to the students from day one, we are going every Wednesday, rain or shine, hot or cold, every Wednesday, come prepared, no excuses. Okay, February comes along. It was one of those minus 30 with a wind chill day. And so I talked to my teaching partner and I were like, yeah, we can't do this. And so we went into class and the kids called us out they were like, whoa, wait a second. I've got my three layers on. I've got my hat. I've got my mitts. You told us we're going outside no matter what. We are ready. We're going outside. And we kind of looked at each other like, yeah, I guess, you know, good call on you. We, we you know, we honored safety, but we're like, yeah, okay. You called us. We're going outside. Because if you know Flemington Park, so I wanna highlight this because you don't need all the fancy gear, right? You're going outside, you don't need the Gore-Tex, you don't need the 
the um you know the patagonia and the and all of that and the you know the fancy boots and that you just need layers and dry right layers and dry so we just made sure we collected extra clothing if we needed and we never had a kid not able to go right so we just made sure we had it and actually we didn't need to collect that much because the kids really just got themselves sorted and we helped them out as much as we could so that's as simple as it is and sometimes we paired up we, we had our reading buddies come along and we would do some reading time if we didn't have yard duty if one of us didn't have yard duty we might have spent more time out there and it was just it was nice on a Wednesday because Wednesdays are hard <laughs> and it was nice to know that we were going to start our day off like that we got the gross motor activity for our kids going and so it was really nice related to that I know I'm going way beyond my 10 minutes uh, I'm moving along I've got a couple minutes left um, two things happening at Jean Lum. One, we um, we are, as you can tell, we're right near the lake. We're taking bird watching hikes just down to Spadina Key and looking all the wildlife. We did it in the December and we're going to take a look at it in May to see what the migration patterns were like. Very simple. Um, we also, brand new school, we don't have a mascot. We don't have colors. So our senior teach, our senior kids, have just finished the community walk just to kind of look at like what is our community all about what do we see we've got high rises we've got sobies we've got the restaurants we've got so marketing lens right so they're thinking okay what is our community about we'll come back and they're building mood boards so it doesn't have to be science science is fine nothing against science but it can be anything um and so oh that was it see i knew i was be good with the timing but i would just say start small um and go for it, honestly. Anything you do inside can be outside. That's all I got. Thanks, Judy. I love your encouragement of new teachers. Mm -hmm. and Thank you for that. And uh, I think you're right. The classic environmental ed advice to start small, do it well, and then grow it from there, right? And I think that absolutely applies in this case. Thank you so much. Great ideas. And lovely to hear what you're doing at a brand new school. So I'd like to uh, introduce you to our third uh, principal for today's panel, and that's Annie Slater. Annie is an elementary school principal in an inner city school in Toronto. She's a former outdoor educator herself, and she's been an advocate for students learning in the natural environment throughout her career. Annie established the OPAL program at two different schools where she's been an administrator and has even created an outdoor education position at her current school. There's a model we gotta have all the principals pick up on. Um, so the students have planned weekly outdoor learning opportunities. I'm sure people are gonna to wanna to hear about that, Annie. Welcome. Um, so, um, hi everyone. So I am the principal at uh, Woburn Junior Public School. It is in the uh, sort of East Scarborough area. Um, my school, about 95% of my students come from high rise uh, apartment buildings. Um, and we are uh, an inner city school, uh, lower socioeconomic. Um, a lot of our kids literally come to school and go right back into their apartment buildings. Uh, not a lot of outdoor play that's happening. Um, my, for, my previous school where I was vice principal was also a, a model school in, for inner city. So um, again, um, something where outdoor play was something that I really was, I was very passionate about to, um, to help establish so that they got really quality play when they were outside. Um, so I definitely, and as uh, Dan mentioned, um, and spoke great about the OPAL program. That is something that I did establish at both, the, at both my former school and my, my current school. Um, another thing that I'm doing to support outdoor play is I'm advocating very similar again to what Dan said. I don't want to be repeating everything, but again, we came and it was just asphalt. A lot of just, you know, and, and kids just walking around and not knowing what to do with themselves. And what got me was, is the, the kindergarten areas were asphalt. And um, you know, and a lot of injuries because kids, you know, would, would fall and scrape their knees or scrape their chin or whatever. And not a lot of, even though we would bring out ride on toys and all that, there just wasn't good play areas. Um, and as uh, Hillary mentioned, I have created this year a, a, a position where it is a prep position uh, that supports outdoor learning. Um, and so pretty much if you have that teacher uh, on that, you know, for a certain period, a uh, couple times a week, you know that those that their kids are going outside. And so we are making sure that that's happening. And of course, we celebrate outdoor play and learning. So I just kind of that was sort of an overview. So just to show you some images. Um, so here are some images of um, the opal at play. Um, 
So OPAL is an amazing program and I don't wanna repeat what Dan said, but what we found as a challenge was um, a lot of it had to do, now this is my former school, Iron View Public School. Um, with with uh, Woolburn, we established the, the OPAL program, but then we had the work action last year and then COVID. Um, and so we have, um, we haven't been able to collect the amount of materials that we had at my former school. And, and um, I know Dan's asking for the milk crates, but Hey, if you've got a snack program, you got to talk to those milk delivery guys. And sometimes they'll slip you a couple, they'll give you some milk crates. Um, but all these materials, a lot of them were things that, you know, we would ask construction sites and we would ask the, the tires were amazing. So the play factor going in and collecting the resources was, was a challenge. And you're always replenishing things because as you can see, some of them are cardboard um, and they would get, ruined after a while and you're just constantly replenishing things and you're looking for play value in almost everything like look at the rags and and um ropes it took us a it took us about a year to feel comfortable bringing ropes out because of course you know you you know and it was something that we had to increase the 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 comfort of our staff of our parents of our community and it came with a lot of meetings like school council meetings um, you know, even the neighbors uh, within this area, you know, they would call the school and say, why is there all this junk in your schoolyard? And we had to talk about it and say that this is what kids were using. And we had some very upset neighbors who said, you know, we don't want to look out our window and see this. But, um, but you know, they, they weren't, they were thinking about, you know, maybe their property value, but we were, you know, our focus stayed with the kids. And we were, you know, the, the kids were getting valuable playtime. Um, there's some more images. Uh, talking about the risky play that Dan was talking about. Um, we also had, um, so, you know, letting them in, and, and, and having those conversations with kids. So, you know, if they were to attempt those spool um, riding, you know, adventures on the pavement, we would say to them, you know, let's, let's look at the risk factor here. Where would be better to do something like this? Where do you think you would be safer? But otherwise we, you know, we went through quite a bit of training and talked about uh, um, what was letting kids kind of determine their risk, their, the risks and, and letting them make those decisions. But sometimes instead of saying, no, stop, that's dangerous, you know, getting into conversation with the kids and having them sort of problem solve on their own. Um, sand, definitely bringing in those sand uh, buckets and shovels and all those. And, and it was incredible to see, you know, how much play value was in with sand. And, you know, just letting their, their imaginations take over. Uh, we had incredible play value. Um, with things like boards and piece of cardboard like you know we never I don't think boxes got into the recycling bin um, our caretaker didn't have to flatten any boxes because the kids would play with them first and after they were flat and wet that's when they would make their way into the recycling bin because there was they had an extra step in their life cycle when when they arrived at our school so uh, play was definitely actually that one picture with uh with the uh, with the boys there um, I think even made it on the on the opal one of the opal um, uh, they had a, um, a banner. So they really loved that picture that we had taken. So, and the other thing was, is that we had older children involved. And so a, a lot of times you see older kids would kind of do their own thing. Uh, a lot of time, uh, and, oops. Um, and so we had older students that started to play and started to build things and sometimes you'd see a mix of ages sometimes you would see our kids from our special needs classes be able to integrate in with the play a lot more easily than if the kids were just playing a game of soccer um, so you saw all kinds of creative play and the different types of play and that's what's great about the opal program um, is that you see different types of play so you might see kids in one section really digging and building and then you see other ones that are doing a little like you know soup kitchen and other ones that are doing more sand play and more risky play. So there was the variety of play that it, it supports. And so we do want to eventually with my current school get to this point. Um, part of it came again with, oh, we also had to bring our trustee on board and our superintendent as well. So having that data, we showed that uh, office referrals greatly decreased when we brought in the OPAL program and had it fully established because kids didn't get in the conflicts that they would or they would problem solved between them because they didn't want to take any playtime away to have to come inside or have to talk to an adult outside and have them figure out the issue. It's like their play was so valuable that they just figured it out. And so, and we had a huge decrease in our office referrals and, and sort of conflicts that would happen in the schoolyard went before we had any, you know, any of this 
uh, for them to do. So it, you know, we showed that data, we, we actually tabulated it. We had that data. So when the trustee would come and say, you know, we have some parents that are worried about their kids, or we have some community members that are complaining about tires around the field, we presented them this and we presented them some the research that came with how loose part play and creative play and unstructured play, the benefits for kids and their mental health. And we, you know, we got we got them on board. And so the next time somebody had a, any kind of issue with it, they were able to, to advocate for it. So part of it is getting everybody on board. And the part about what Judith was talking about was the all weather play. That was something that because in some communities, like in my current school, if we have a very cold day or if we have a lot of snow, we have huge absenteeism at school. They just don't come to school. And so, you know, and, and, and getting parents to understand that there is no bad weather, just the bad clothes, like bad clothing and not having enough the proper clothing for a situation. So as long as you dress for the weather, you can go outside and you can still play. Um, you know, and then we had our kids, we had Opal ambassadors that were, um, they would decide, well, if today's a rainy day, maybe we won't take out the cardboard tubes or the car, you know, certain things. So they would, they would decide what kind of material came out, but there's always enough for kids to be able to play and, and do. And we still had the kids that played soccer at the one end of the field. And we still had the kids that played at the basketball nets, but there were just so many choices. Um, when I arrived at, um, Woolburn, um, we, you know, the one thing that stood out at me after coming from that school, from coming from um, IMVU was the, again, similar to what Dan was saying is like, yeah, here, here's a kindergarten. We have two kindergarten areas on either side of the school. This is one of them. Um, they do have a little bit of grass on one side with one tree for shade. This is the, actually the good one. Um, and then the other side. So this was for two classes. And if you see in the top corner, I don't know, it's kind of small, you can see the other side, which is just fenced in pavement uh, on the other side. They, they look onto the rest of the school field, but they, you know, it's kind of a pen. And it really, it's a pen that I wouldn't even want to put my dog in. Like, it just did not have an, even though we, the teachers would bring out bins of toys and bring out things, it just was, it was just such a stark cement area. So I hadn't actually even started. I had just been promoted. Um, this was in 2018 to say, uh, and I had just come, it was August and I contacted um, uh, our, our amazing facility department and, uh, and said, you know what, can we just, can we get a review here? Can we, is there a way that we can, can do something to fix the play areas in our school? So on the other side, you can see here on the right, um, the sort of our, our um, the plan. So that back kindergarten area, that uh, top blue area is what's up on the screen, that's cementary. And what we've requested is that we flip the play area to, um, to the front of the school. So these are our two areas, but we're going to flip and we're at the very front of our school where it's kind of small, but it says number one is going to be, it's already grass, it's already got trees. We want that to become our kindergarten, our new play area. So we advocated for that. Now due to, of course, you know, construction dates and all that. And then we had COVID, all that um, construction is supposed to start because everything takes a couple of years in, in the school board. Uh, construction is supposed to start in a month or two. Um, we've already started getting our storage bunkers uh, delivered so that we can get, um, we can be able to uh, keep all our loose part play in it. So, you know, it's, it was exciting when these got delivered because it means it's the beginning of the construction. So advocating, following up, having those meetings with facility team, it's just that constant, you know, and, and the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So we wanted to be squeaky and we wanted to say that our little ones, our littlest uh, students needed to have better play areas. So that is, so the advocating piece. And so these, this doesn't, you know, it's just a plan of uh, where all the new things are gonna go. We're gonna have a big giant covered sandbox. We're gonna have a stage area. We're gonna have all kinds of garden um, seating area and a raised garden for kids to plant in. So there's a lot of things that um, are going to be in that new area. So we're very excited for our kindergartens to have a better area. So this is our pre preliminary outdoor design plan. And finally, the, 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 the um, position that we created. So we knew that, you know, this year, part especially with, with uh, COVID, we were very much encouraged to take our kids outdoors throughout the year and so when we were talking about staffing for this year we knew that we need prep teachers we need teachers that are going to be providing those preps for our classroom teachers and um, I was very fortunate to have hired a teacher that was a former outdoor ed uh, teacher herself and had her uh, phys ed specialist but also had a lot of experience with outdoor ed so we were able to then create a prep position where uh, she would go 
And, um, you know, and the teachers knew that if they had that period coming up, that they would get start getting the kids ready to go outside. And that's what they would do. And so depending, she would, she works with the teachers and talks to them. Um, okay, well, what, you know, what are you doing in your social studies or your math or your science? Or, you know what, let's just wing it. Let's go for a walk. Let's do a nature walk. Let's go into, we have a fairly close by um, natural area at the very end of our field, take them exploring. And so I'm just showing you some tweets that had been put out um, in the in the nicer weather. Um, so it's sometimes it's creating that opportunity. Not all our staff will be of, will be um, outdoorsy, as we can say, um, but but by creating a position, and sometimes we even have the teachers go out and say, you know what, I know I have a prep, but I'm going to come out for a little bit and kind of see what you're doing. Or sometimes the teacher would say, I'll meet you there that time and I'll pick up my kids out there. So whether it's art, whether it's um, looking at, you know, doing um, some reading, you know, sitting on some rocks, um, that is creating that opportunity. And so it got our, the rest of our teachers wanting to take their kids outside a little bit too. And so if there's any kind of sort of silver lining with the whole COVID um, thing would be that, you know, being outdoors and how it's so much healthier to be outside um, was underlined. And so our staff are starting to do that um, in addition to the kids going out with this position, with, uh, with this prep, this teacher that is in our school. So that's my part. Andy, I love seeing those photographs of your schoolyard with the loose parts play, as well as the activities that your outdoor ed teacher is doing. And, and I know a number of principals are actually doing the same approach for cut periods. So I love seeing a concrete example of what that looks like. Thank you so much. Uh, I've got one last principal to introduce you to today. And uh, David's been with us a number of times in these webinars in the past, so we're happy to welcome him back. Uh, David Hawker Budlowski is a father of two elementary students in the TDSV. And he's also the centrally signed principal in the Toronto District School Board with responsibility for supporting the Toronto Outdoor Education Schools. He has assisted in the setup recently in his spare time, uh, we like to tease him, um, in his spare time he's helped with the uh, setup and running of LC Elementary uh, Virtual School uh, 3. Uh, David's in his 22nd year uh, with the TDSB and his sixth year in the role of supporting outdoor education in the board. This year will prove to be no uh, like no other. I think you're absolutely right about that, David. And he's committed to supporting a return to school, which prioritizes mental health and well-being for all staff and students, which include maximizing outdoor spaces as a key component to teaching and learning. So welcome, David. Thanks so much. And before I start presenting, um, it is so fantastic to be on this panel with these amazing principals that are giving real examples of getting kids outside on a regular basis and supporting their staff and it's happening in real time and it shows the diversity of our city um, from our seven schools with large spaces uh, that Annie was speaking to at Woburn or Iron View or Judith or Dan right in the heart of downtown and seeing that any space is a space that you can take advantage of and get outside and getting outside doesn't mean just free time and that learning isn't happening but often that that free and unstructured time is when some of the most valuable and important learning can happen and um covid if if we see any silver lining of covid there's been a real talk about the importance of being outside the use of open spaces and, and minimizing the risks of being indoors. And I spent a lot of my fall, August and September, talking about the importance of learning outside. And that learning outside isn't outdoor education. Outdoor education isn't something that happens at one of our outdoor ed centers or our partner organizations. Outdoor education is something that has to be happening every day in every community, in every classroom, in every school if we're truly supporting our students uh, and giving them a wide breadth of opportunities to get outside. Um, through my years in the TDSB, going through the old quads, I've taught and been an administrator in the Southwest, the Southeast and the Northeast. Um, not a whole lot in the Northwest, but uh, through my current central roles, I've spent a lot of time there. And, and the one thing that's common in all the places across the TDSB is the opportunities to get outside and that we truly are um, a city within a park um, and no matter where we are there are city parks close to us and again through covid um, the 
acknowledgement of the city allowing schools to make use and access to the park. So many of uh, the teachers are here. It, you know, if you know there's a local green space close to you, talk to your principals. There's a, an easy way for principals to let our planning department know. They let the city know there's not a big permit process or anything. It's just about managing and getting out into those spaces. In the fall, late in the fall, November, December, um, through the emergency COVID meetings that were happening, trustees brought forward a motion. And, and for me personally, this motion was a double-edged sword. And the motion brought forward was the use of outdoor spaces during instructional time. And as a teacher, administrator, and centrally assigned principal supporting outdoor education, it, it cringed it, that the uh, trustees and public didn't feel that we were making use of the time outdoors. And so um, in, in December, this was passed at board. And as a response, um, we've put forward a, a report uh, through the Program and School Services Committee um, supporting the the use of outdoor spaces during instructional time a report went through uh in january we're giving an update uh, next week and and then uh, uh, presenting a long-term plan before the end of the year so what i'm going to share with you is really our quick start um oh and i realized i switched windows without sharing my screen and so um we created uh a website taking learning outdoors and I want to acknowledge the team uh, that put this together both through the outdoor education department but also the sustainability office and uh, both Jen Vetter and Chris Metropolis who are, are part of our facilitation team today played a huge part in this um, as well as Kristen Evers a green project leader um, from the outdoor ed side we had uh, Sean West from the Sheldon Center for Outdoor Education, Amy Wilson from the uh, at the island, and Rosie Shelson, uh, our amazing administra office administrator at Forest Valley, support this work along with our communications team to pull this together and have it posted. Um, before I go to the website, I really want to um, point out how to get to this website. The easiest space is if you go to the TDSB public website, which is up on the screen right now, and scroll down. On the right-hand side, there's a new learning outdoor information and resources. And by following that link, um, it takes you to the outdoor learning website. Uh, it's also uh, on the internal TDSB for our staff. Um, although it's starting to go down the list of new items. So uh, tdsb.on.ca slash learning outdoors. And we know we have uh, teacher candidates and people from other boards joining us today and watching the webinars. So um, this is, is public domain for people to get in. As we go through the website, um, and I'm gonna try and honor our time, um, we want to make it as easy to navigate as possible. I want to highlight on just two of our tabs uh, for you uh, and acknowledge that we do have a learning, outdoor learning and COVID-19 as a separate tab. It has a, some specific uh, COVID information, uh, our TDSB operational uh, and program guidelines, but it is set separate. So, because we are hoping as we emerge from the pandemic time, teaching and learning outdoors will continue. So noticing that we're mostly teachers and teacher candidates, I'm gonna start with the resources for your class tab. Um, and as we go here, uh, we want to uh, really take a look at supporting people where they're at and moving them forward. So getting started. Each tile is an easily navigated space um, where it goes to resources available for you. Um, teachers, if you have administrators that are not supportive or supporting you going outside, we hope that here you have the tools in your back pocket to support you um, in your pedagogy. 
um, and going out. Not only the um, theoretical pieces, um, but also resources. Uh, part of the board motion was supporting outdoor learning, not just for those in school, but also understanding that about uh, a third of the, the student population is online right now. And how can we support um, virtual learning as well? So again, resources for virtual, virtual learning. Almost every page has a table um, that looks like this, all that have live links that take you to uh, real-time resources um, that can take you into different spaces and places, uh, virtual field trips that can go into your classroom, um, activities that students can do, whether on a balcony, looking out a window, or access to a backyard or green space. Um, I'm going to go back to the homepage, acknowledging the time um, and resources for your school. Um, again, we want to support administrators and teachers and families as we go outside. Um, so uh, for school programs, we have links to uh, TDSB partners uh, through the TRCA, the school programs, the uh, excursions through the outdoor TOES, uh, the Toronto Outdoor Education Schools and Eco Schools program. Um, and Annie was talking about improving your school grounds. And again, we really want to support um, making usable outdoor spaces. When I was the principal at Cassandra Public School, what I consider part of my legacy there is what we call our coal space, our kindergarten outdoor learning area, um, kindergarten outdoor learning environment, and this whole idea that what happens inside happens outside, and that the learning moves in and out. So supporting um, that space, uh, Annie talked about uh, the consultations and viability review. Here's a quick link to the sustainability site and the uh, process for school ground greening, requesting um, uh, a school ground visit. We had Dan, Annie, and Judy, all Judith, all talking about uh, Opal and the importance of loose parts. We have our loose parts brochure linked uh, here as well, and stock tank resources. So again, how can we support outdoor play and learning? And you know, Dan pointed out some pictures of his space. And you know, there you are right in the middle of the concrete jung jungle and creating these places where students can plant, dig, observe, and move forward. So um, I'm going to try and honor the time, uh, leave the space open to the group for questions. I know there's been a ton of stuff coming up through the chat as well. Um, so uh, we can go through some of those things. Um, I really wanted to put something out there in the space because uh, last night I was at the governance and policy committee meeting as we presented the excursion policy and someone spoke about the one to 15 ratio for excursions. I really want to guide TDSB folks to the TDSB excursion policy and put the onus on teachers and administrators for excursions in the immediate community, the ratios um, are to the discretion of the principal of what that looks like. Um, and as I think it's a great idea to pair classes together. I think it builds capacity um, and it shares the growth because there, is, there are these teacher leaders in the school and that's how we're gonna build capacity in the system. But again, knowing where you're walking who you're walking, the experience and environment, um, that really is a sliding scale. And, and I really want to encourage people that doing things like walking Wednesdays, uh, Judith shared that. I did it in my grade two, grade four, grade five class as well. Um, and we went outside, rain or shine, snow or sun, and, and it just made it easier uh, to move forward when that's part of the expectation, because we always will have 
families, community members, and, and colleagues that, that are going to look at the barriers and not the opportunities that are there. And so how can we show, share and show that off? So I will stop sharing and turn things back over. Thank you, David. Um, I am also sensitive to the, the needs of people who might have to leave for family responsibilities. So I'm just launching the feedback poll for those who do have to pop out. But you are welcome to stay on and ask questions of these principles. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank all of you for sharing your expertise and your enthusiasm for outdoor learning. Uh, it's been so great uh, hearing all of these positive things that are happening with OPAL and with other forms of outdoor learning in the board. And uh, it's, I just found it really inspiring today. So thank you so much for your time. We know this is a very busy time for principals uh, right now. And so taking time out of your schedule to present today was greatly appreciated.